Kevin Raber and I'm back with you. Uh, another conversation with a photographer, and today I have Sharon Tenenbaum with us. I said that correctly, right, Sharon? You did. You did. Tenenbaum, like the Royals. There you go. That's <laughs> such a good show. Yeah. Anyway, um, I've, we've published a number of stories over the years that uh, Sharon has written for the site. Uh, she's an amazing photographer. And as we've been doing on all the other conversations with, uh, I want to talk to Sharon a little bit about Number one, how she got started in photography, where she is right now, what she's doing under this uh, COVID isolation and lockdown that we're in, and uh, how she sees things emerging into the future for the kind of projects that she does. Um, like all of us, uh, we've all been challenged in this and have all um, been hit by it. It's the, probably the one thing in the world that everybody uh, is suffering from and fighting in one way or another, and uh, you know we got to figure out ways to make the best of this. And uh, so. Uh, Sharon's agreed to spend the afternoon or at least the next half hour, hopefully, with us and tell us a little bit about herself. So, Sharon, tell me a little bit about where you are, how you got there, and uh, how you got interested in, in photography before we actually go into some of the cool shots that you, 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 you've you done over the years. Yes. Oh, great. So, I actually started my life out as an engineer, civil engineer, and I was working in engineering for quite a bit until I reached a point in my life where I felt that I changed as a person from the one that I was when I went to university to study engineering. And I knew that I needed a change in my life, didn't really know what that change was. So I decided to go traveling and go soul searching. So I packed a backpack and gave my boss I like I literally walked into his office and asked for a raise and three months off with the same breath hoping he'd just <laughs> fire me so the decision would be made right there but he said yes to both so uh, I was kind of lucky I guess in hindsight and um, my dad gave me a camera for my trip I wasn't really uh, photographing much before that I did kind of fool around with a film camera like 20 years prior just kind of very hobbyist, not much, but I learned the aperture and shutter speed concepts. And then for my trip, he just gave me a Fuji SLR like um, camera so that it's small enough to fit everywhere mm -hmm. I go. And it has manual modes. So kind of the best of both worlds and a great beginner camera. And for me, it was more just seeing the world with a new pair of eyes. And I felt that this is what I was born to do. I was getting amazing recognition for my shots and I loved it. So when I came back, I kind of did everything in my power to make it work. And um, what is it? 13 years later, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> Time yeah. flies, doesn't it? Um, yeah. So where, where did you go on your trip? Where, where did you start off? In, so uh, I started in Southeast Asia. And well, that's where I went. And I started off in India. So I landed straight into New Delhi. And it's quite a shock, but it's an amazing place to photograph. Your senses are just bombarded. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there's no lack of subject matter there. And so I was shooting different scenes within the streets of Delhi, the landscapes of uh, India. From there, I continued to Nepal, did a trek. From there, I went to Burma, Myanmar, which I've gone back since, which is probably one of the most fascinating and beautiful countries in the world. And, um, and then just kind of spent some time on the beaches of Thailand before heading back. But you were photographing the scenes and the landscapes and uh, you know, somewhere along the line, your photography transitioned to a style, meaning you know, I could look at a bunch of photographs on a wall or in a competition or whatever, and I would be able to recognize your, your images. They, they, they have. Yeah. So I have to admit that that didn't happen overnight because while I was traveling, I was shooting street photography, photojournalism style. And then when I came back to Vancouver, all of a sudden, you don't have the colorful, beautiful people that you have in Southeast Asia. You have to see your own backyard with a new pair of eyes. So I started thinking, okay, how can I photograph Vancouver now with enough interest as I did my travel? And then I kind of organically gravitated, I guess, to bridges because subconsciously from my architectural, from my engineering background, I gravitated towards architectural subject matter. 
So I started photographing, like there's a famous Lionsgate Bridge in Vancouver. There's the Capilano Suspension Bridge. And then with time, I was just drawn to architectural subject matter. And that evolved my style. And not only that, but when I started photography, it was more about composition. But then later, as my uh, kind of eye grew and, uh, what's the word, maybe ripened, um, I learned to incorporate the post-processing into my vision because, and this is something I try to hammer down into my students because I teach a lot of photography now, is when you're at a scene and when you're looking at something, you see something through your mind's eye. And that is not what the camera sees. The camera is objective and it'll pick up every little nitty gritty detail that you saw or didn't see. And what you saw in your mind's eye could be something completely different. So when I come home and I put the image in my post-processing software, I try to bring back what it was that I saw in my mind's eye and fascinated me. That's why my images have a distinct look because I try to relive that experience and share that with my viewers. You know, that takes for so many people years and years. So when you're, when you're actually composing, you're also, and correct me if I'm wrong, thinking a lot about how you're going to post process the image to achieve. the Absolutely. Absolutely. I have to see in my mind's eye when I'm composing the potential of the image of how it would be in post processing. Your, your images are, are so geometric and uh, well-crafted, and, and uh, I don't see a lot of color in your work. A lot of it's black and white, because a lot of architectural lends itself towards form and geometry. I also love photographing trees. I take the black and white photograph of the tree. I process it, first of all, black and white, so that it can stand on its own merit and look great. And then I hand paint the tree with acrylics. Oh, and wow. I, now that's I've something. been recently adding levels of resin to them as well. So it's, it comes out gorgeous. But your, your, your styles with your black and white are, are so interesting. Now, where did you learn your, your post-processing? I presume most of it's done in Photoshop. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. I, I was born straight into Photoshop. I never went into Lightroom. I never learned Lightroom. I'm actually just learning it now. And... Um, I was born straight into Photoshop. I had friends who just kind of, I had a friend that was a magazine editor, gave me a few tips here and there. And then I would buy um, magazines. Like we're talking back in 2008, 2009, where there's still, people would still buy digital photography magazines with hard copies. And I would follow the before and after in all the steps. And I would try to recreate that myself with the same steps that were instructed in the magazine. And that's how I pretty much taught myself. This was before you can just Google everything on YouTube and you, everything would be at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. um, now, if I need something specific, I just look at it on YouTube. But I'm pretty much self-taught. Um, I do try to ask as much as I can or if there's a special workshop or course, I'll attend it. But overall, I never had a proper education. But there's something wrong with... Uh a proper education being an education where you trained yourself. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I, I think I was just, sorry, it, it me. I just, I, I think I was just so discouraged from my university days of engineering because it really puts your thought in a box and it doesn't encourage for like free creativity and thought. So I thought I don't want any institution to kill my creative thought and, that's good and bad because I made a lot of mistakes along the way that if I would have had a proper education would have <clears throat> saved it, but then it did give me that free reign to explore. There could be a lot said about, you know, the formal education of mastering the, the basic rules and then learning how to go out and, and break them. Um, you know, I, I had an instructor once that said, you look, you know, I wish I would have had you in kindergarten because I would have encouraged freer thinking and his, his concept was, he says, you know, you give a, a, a young child a pen and paper and say, draw a picture of your house or, you know, the, the hillside or the landscape or whatever it might be. And you'll get basically um, an uninfluenced image the way these people see it. And mm -hmm. 
then, you know, somebody comes and goes, well, the house doesn't look like that. Your mom doesn't look like that. Windows don't look like that. And, you know, begin to hammer it into you on what they think it should be. And you, you, you take that creative uh, ability away from an individual. I went to four years of art school. Now, while you were an engineer and got discouraged, I went to four years of art school and went uh, and got photo and film degrees and yeah. came out and go, now what do I do? Because yeah. they certainly didn't prepare me. Um, so after that, it was self-education and has been all the way with um, one very valuable business um, uh, lessons in there along the way too, because that was the other thing they don't teach you very well is how to actually make money taking pictures. And exactly. uh, once you kind of learn that secret of, you know, what the costs are and how to, you know, the price to work properly and, um, you know, learn how to say no to like people saying, can you come over to our house for a cocktail hour and maybe bring your camera? <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah. so anyway, so you, 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 you've developed this style, but somehow or rather you're making a living at this. Um, yeah. How did, how did that turn around? I mean, did you sell your architectural work and your, your landscape work? So I told you I came back from Southeast Asia and I wanted to um, work as a photographer and leave engineering. But I was very, very fortunate that when I gave my boss my notice, he thought that I'd be, like you said, join the circus. Yeah. And I'd be on the streets in a week. So he said to me, wait, 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 I'll get you a laptop, work from home till your photography takes off. This is like in 2007, before it was very common for people to work from home. So that was um, a godsend because I would have, because I personally was thinking to go work at Starbucks and just supplement my salary, but that was insane. But what kind of boss, I mean, has that much faith in you that lets you come back to work? I know. Go home and work. And say, when your photography's there, I know I'm going to lose you most likely. Yeah. So he knew he was going to lose me. So he was just encouraging. He, he tried to get it, make a win-win. So yeah. he can have me work part-time while I can to pay the bills and still have time to do my engineering. And it was time for me to leave. He respected that. Cool. Um, so I did that for four and a half years. And I tell people, don't leave your day job so quick <laughs> when you want a career in photography. Because think about all the years that it took you to go to university and now you're in a different university, you're in the university of life and you're learning business and you're not only learning your craft, but you're also learning business side of it. So it takes time. Kind of a school of hard knocks. If I'm Exactly. Sure. Get through a little bit of that, I'm sure. Exactly. So you have to be as creative as you are in your work. You have to be creative in business. Um, and I was, starting slowly, slowly to um, own my, hone my craft and become better at what I am because people are not going to just buy photographs that they can take themselves. They're going to buy something that they can't do themselves. So you have to really distinguish your work from everybody else. Was your early work landscape or did you try to do architecture using your... I did. I did. I kind of also studied um, long exposure photography back when I started. I took a long exposure workshop because I was just fascinated with how different it looks from reality. Yep, yep. And I find that long exposure, I, I teach also fine art photography and long exposure, mm. what it does is we don't see reality that way. Oh. So it makes us see the world differently. And that's what captivates us, that different way of seeing the world. And I was just blown away by it. So I was shooting a lot of long exposure as well. And that, was very different for a lot of people. So that helped sell prints as well. You've, you've kind of become a master of that in um, kind, of, kind of a good segue. Uh, you have now recently just published a, a, a long exposure ebook, correct? Yes. So I originally published a long exposure ebook in 2011. It was called um, How to Create Long Exposure Fine Art Photography. And throughout the years, I saw a lot of evolution in my own work and in the and how more popular long exposure has become cameras are more accommodating towards long exposure filter companies it's becoming uh, i just felt that the book was dated and it needed a revamp so i added over 100 more pages to the book with examples and additional art tips and more current information um, and now i feel i truly honestly believe that it is the ultimate guide 
<laughs> to long exposure. So I called it the ultimate guide to long exposure fine art photography. You know, um, we'll put links to the book in the article. Um, so, and in the YouTube description, you, yeah. if you'd like to uh, uh, get a hold of this book, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting uh, a hold of your it. Your coffee, yeah. So, uh, I helped her pick a cover. <laughs> it's fine. You did, you did. I was, I was doing a little, um, uh, a little survey among friends, which cover was the best because my designer sent me a few drafts and yeah. It, it looks like a lovely book and uh, you know, I can't wait to take a look at that. I've uh, also subscribed recently to a magazine called Long Exposure or LE. I don't know if you've seen that out there. LE Mag, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what a what a great inspiration to you you know, get the tripod out and start doing, you know, 15, 20 minute <laughs> exposures. It really does change things. Um, it, it's, it takes you into a different planet. So hopefully we can maybe get an article and, and push your, your book a little bit on the site because it would be good that when a lot of people can get back out and photograph again, that, uh, you know, they, they look at not setting themselves up on a mountain and taking a picture when the light is right, but actually realizing that you can start taking a picture and wait to see what the light does. Yes. And what's nice about long exposure photography is you can even get out now because I know here in BC, we are encouraged. Act we're not under extreme lockdown. We are encouraged to go out for walks, not socialize as much, keep our distance. But when you're out shooting long exposure, you're out on a shoreline on the beach or somewhere in nature. So you're not interacting with too many people. So it's actually a great self-isolation practice. It is nice to go out by yourself. You know, I know if I get into my Jeep, um, nobody's been in it but my wife, so it's not contaminated. You know, I know I can park it, you know, set up on the, in the pickup bed part of it and, you know, you know set up and, and shoot some pictures. And uh, it's probably the one thing that's kept me sane. While I love doing what I do, uh, I enjoy shooting pictures. I mean, you know, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your finger gets absolutely. itchy. It's like the best therapy for you. you know, I get out there and take a few pictures and, uh, I don't have to go to a therapist. Um, uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I say that about exercise because I love riding my bike. And I say you could spend so much money of therapy if you just buy a bike. Yeah, it's because, uh, you, you know, it's when you're out there and you, you can yeah. reflect. And God only knows we've done a lot of it around this house in the last week or two. Um, you know, it, it's um, quite nice. So well, let's talk about gear. Um, yeah. What, what kind of uh, camera systems are you using now to accomplish these long exposures and so forth? So if you want to shoot long exposure, you don't need anything too fancy. You do need a camera that has manual mode and bulb mode. Very important because lo daytime long exposure, you're shooting during the day. And if you want to get those beautiful skies that have the streaky clouds, it's pretty much the white clouds that move on the background of a blue sky. Because right. what you're doing is you're putting neutral density filters in front of your lens to darken um, the light coming in. So to prevent light coming in. So you could expose for eight minutes, 10 minutes at a time. So while the clouds are moving, whatever's not moving is staying stolid. So you're getting streaks. Right. But, so um, what, do you the have gear, a, you were asking gear. So um, gear it's funny because I am not, I am not a gear person. Okay, and every, every time somebody asks me, what camera do I shoot with? It's like that saying, do you ask a cook what oven do they have? Uh, but, uh, I would be in trouble if I asked you, do you shoot at F22 or F8 or look at one of your pictures and tell me, well, tell me how you did it so I can go out and copy it. But yeah. I, I know if I don't ask, I'll get people go, well. That's fine. I so I started out uh, with Canon. Actually, I started out with Olympus. Then I went to Nikon. Then I went full frame to Canon shooting a, with Canon Mark II for a very long time. It's quite a workhorse, the Marks, yep. with those cameras. I love them. The thing is, they were breaking my back. <laughs> like, I remember being in Mexico, lugging two camera bodies, three lenses, and a tripod to the top of a mountain, and I thought, I'm just, I'm done. <laughs> like, this is killing me. So I actually downsized to the mirrorless now, which is awesome. Yeah. Model model yeah. So now I'm with the Fuji X-T2. Oh, great yeah. camera. And the X-T4, I'm waiting for, I've ordered mine. I, I'm waiting for that to come out. And that looks like it's going to be, so I'm selling all my other ones. And I'm, I've had a whole bunch of X-T2s and I think two X-T3s and an X-H1. And I'm going to take one of the X-T3s and convert it to infrared. Yes. That's yes. the other thing I really Yes. Like. So somebody gave me an infrared camera, hand-me-down. It was an old Canon Rebel. 
So it's not the great image. It's not the great camera to capture a beautiful image because you're going to be limited with what you can do with it. But it's so much fun. So much fun. So I think I'm also eventually going to take a good camera and convert it to. But hopefully a camera that's light. Uh, the, the Fuji the Fuji camera system is, you know, it, it's like I said, I'm, I've got Olympus and Nikon and 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 uh, Sony and um, the Fuji, and uh, I'm going to keep Fuji for APS-C and uh, Sony for the full frame. Um, I've got the A7R4 now and the A9, and that A7R4 with the high megapixel is fairly light camera. It's mirrorless, um, yeah. but the, the quality of that file is just so nice. But the Fuji. Uh, just even uh, I, I shoot raw and then usually uh, pick acros with R for the you know, the red filter in, imitation to get the dark dark sky and it's yeah. just such a gorgeous file. Yeah, yeah. yeah now, I, you, I can't complain. I love it too. So you're 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 obviously shooting raw and then doing most of your work in Photoshop. Are you working with any raw processor at all? I use Photoshop. Yeah, Photoshop. I use Photoshop. I use Lightroom for specific things like lens correction. I use Lightroom or if I need to, when I'm doing my stacking images, because I've also been recently doing quite a bit of stacking, which looks like multiple exposures and cubism style images, which I love. Yeah. So I need to kind of load them up in Lightroom and then take them into Photoshop because I need to reference back some images within the stack that I can't really see in Lightroom. Because I add masks and stuff, so yeah, you 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 have a complicated. Well, I think it's complicated. Every, anytime I get into layers, I always get lost. <laughs> no, no, no! It's so easy. It's so easy. I always tell people, just think of the old drafting days where you had your base map and then you had translucent sheets above. That's what it is. It's so easy. Yeah, I I, I, I can get it, and I just uh, compared to some people that you know work with a lot of luminosity masking. I kind of do that now in Capture One, which allows me to do it on my RAWs. And by the way, it's a, a great RAW processor for, for Fuji RAW. Um, uh, I've heard, I've heard great things about the Capture One. I have. You know, being yeah. an X Phase One employee and owner and vice president, um, you know, I, I, I know some of the guys in there with the software and they all bought these Fuji cameras. And um, at the beginning when Fuji came out with this whole X Trans sensor, they weren't really excited about trying to write a raw processing uh, algorithms for it, but since a lot of the guys in the, the engineering side had it, they really figured out how to do a really good algorithm for it. And uh, it's a raw processor, it does amazingly well. You should try to experiment sometime and you know run it through a couple different ways of doing things. Absolutely, And then get yeah. yourself into Photoshop after that, you know? But just, I might uh, do that, yeah. yeah it's something that it just, you know, kind of an offshoot. I don't, I don't have to sell it because I'm not selling Capture One, I just find, for my Fuji files, it it does amazing good at it. And of course, Fuji puts it in the box, you know, with the cameras now too. So um, you probably can download the Fuji version at no charge or something ridiculous there if you'd like. I hope so. Anyway, yeah. try it out sometime if you can. Now, let, who who do you find are your customers? You're, are you exhibiting in a gallery? How do you sell your work? So I have to say that. I have two different avenues. I have my prints, my images, and then I have my teachings because I define myself not only as a fine art photographer, but as an educator. Okay. So I have uh, digital products that I sell, like the ebook, video tutorials, and I teach a lot of workshops. And I teach either destination international workshops in New York, Chicago, um, Valencia. But I also teach at a local college here in Vancouver, but I do a lot of online workshops as well. Yeah. Um, I, I'm teaching a lot of Photoshop and like image stacking. So I'm finding that especially now during COVID, all the online teaching is just booming because people are stuck at home and this is the time that they have to sit and learn. So I have the teaching and then people that are, um, my students for my customers for my teachings are normally photographers that want to learn how to do what I do or just want to learn how to improve their own. Mm -hmm. And then the clients who buy my actual images are not necessarily photographers. They're just, they appreciate the art of it, but they can't do it themselves. I find that a lot of people that do have cameras and are even hobbyist photographers 
don't buy prints because they'd rather just print their own. It's it's a challenge then. So you you, you won't be making a, a living selling the the photographs, but uh, you you're doing a lot with teaching. So are you doing pre-recorded or live webinar type? Uh, I'm doing live webinar type. Um, now I do it through Zoom. I do small groups of six. Um, I do have every Tuesday at 10 a.m. during COVID a free one hour photo talk and learn session oh, cool. in which I choose four people to submit images to me and I review them and we talk about them, how to make them better and analyze them. Um, but I am working. It's funny because this whole COVID situation really hammered down the necessity to create more online um, products. So I am working on some online courses that people can just purchase and download kind of like Linda style, lynda.com style videos. Good. I, I think that's uh, the few courses. We're, we're going to be planning some of those at uh, PhotoPXL too. Um, and we had them planned and, but you know, now's the time where I can't put a production together because I would need my cameraman. And yeah, a lot of the ones I do, I actually have, you know, two of us doing something so that we can interact with each other over the computer and talk about, you know, this and that and you know a little bit different than uh you know the way others have done hopefully we can pick that up again once uh we can get back into the, the gallery and the studio shooting again but yeah. um you know and, and of course my workshops probably like yours are destination workshops well you know they're they're not happening anymore for this year no i was supposed to be in spain right now actually now it was supposed to have the workshop was supposed to be april um two to five i believe it was the worst time ever. No, oh, yeah. I've canceled um, uh, a Faroe Islands workshop and uh, a Palouse workshop, one of my favorite places yeah. for landscape. Yeah. And uh, right now, the only workshop I still haven't canceled yet is the uh, Salvbar Norway workshop. And I'm still not sure. Uh, probably not going to happen. It's in August. But I can't see mm -hmm. any of this changing for quite a while because people just you know, aren't going to want to be in planes or hotels and, you know, near a lot of other people. So mm -hmm. uh, we kind of just wait and see what happens over the, <laughs> the, the coming, coming weeks and months, I guess. So. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing else. You just have to embrace the new reality and kind of roll with it. Isn't it strange though? It feels like we've gone through some kind of Star Trek wormhole or something. <laughs> where, you know, today we woke up and we're on this other side and uh, you know, we, we, nobody can do anything. People are dying and, you know, it's a whole new kind of fight. And it uh, is. I, I, I'm, one of the things that I really wish it would come out of this, maybe, you know, as photographers, we'll all figure out a way to work closer together is that, you know, since we're all battling the same thing worldwide, it's kind of like a science fiction movie where you always thought the aliens would come and we'd have to all, you know, figure out how to conquer the aliens together. And in essence, you know, that's what's come, except, you know, we don't know what this alien looks like. We can't see it. We know what it looks like. And some mean looking alien too, if you really think about it, but gosh, just, uh, you know. I think it's humbling. Like I find it humbling because I think we tend to overestimate our capabilities and what, like we kind of see ourselves as invincible and we make so much plans and we like to be so much in control of things. And then uh, situations like this, like these remind us how insignificant we are in the world and how we can really be erased very easily if we're just not careful enough. I think we, you know, we could probably talk photography all forever and ever, and I, I'd want to do more with you, but focus sometime uh, on some of the, the work you've done and you know, maybe you know, give a demonstration of how you take one image and you know, do some of the magic that you've done with it. Um, yeah, I'd love to. I could do a little post-processing session. Yeah, and I, I need to take one of your online classes. I, I'm so busy myself, but i got to find some time. And you know, first thing I'm going to do is get your book. So um, I will email you my book. Okay, that'd be great. It's too bad I can't sign it with a dedication. Oh, yeah, be, <laughs> um, but in any case, we'll put all the links to all this stuff in the article um, and below in uh, the YouTube uh, part of things. So you can uh, visit Sharon's website, see the amazing photography she does. Thank you. Um, I really, you know, it's, there's landscape photography and there's architectural photography, but there's somewhere you've managed to blend in both of those with such thought and, you know, such a great eye of composition that, you know, from the first time I saw your work and we started doing some things together article wise, uh, I was just hooked. I mean, I think you're a very talented individual and you seem like you have a great life story and, uh, 
Um, I, I do hope someday our paths will cross where we can shoot together and have a few laughs and then go back and drink some beer or something. Uh, it sounds like it'd be a lot so of fun. Too. It's funny because I remember the first time I sent you a proposition for an article, it was about my ebook, The Left and Right Brain, and you wrote me back an email. I'm sitting here with a cup of re- with a glass of red wine in my hand, <laughs> reading your ebook, and I'm finding it fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> I thought and this is an awesome guy. <laughs> what motivates me is my travels in the world, and I'm sure you've seen it too when you go to Spain or any place. You know, all these challenges and things we have in the world and you know, between countries and so forth. But you know, you put a photographer with a camera. Uh, in his hand, let him snap a shot, and you're going to see the same smile, and he takes that camera away from his face. You know, it's kind of one of those universal things that, that you have a passion, and uh, it's shared no matter what language and wherever you are in the world. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know, maybe that's what makes me keep going, is just that joy of seeing everybody enjoy taking pictures. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's for me... You're, you're a true educator because you enjoy yeah. sharing your passion. It's, it's, I mean, I think that's what it's, you know, what I enjoy most. Um, uh, I mean, there's a personal side of things too, where I never get bored, but I never get everything done either. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, don't you ever have that, you have that long list of things you want to do and yeah, yeah, how far yeah. you want to take it and it just doesn't get there. So you got to focus, roll up your sleeves and just know, but I'm the stick walking to one thing. I'm child for ADD. Yeah. <laughs> Adult. And, and, uh, you know, I asked my father-in-law, who was a psychologist about that. I said, well, you think I should like go get help for it now? He says, what, at your age? <laughs> it's yeah. probably what given you the success of being able to multitask and, you know, do so many things at one time. So it's I, great I like because that. you come up with a lot of great ideas. Yeah. The, the, the disadvantage is you don't follow through with them, but then you need people. You need to delegate them to other people to follow through. You should be the brainstormer. Yeah, well, and other someday again, I, I will be, I mean, I got a good team with me, but you know, I keep them also pretty busy also. So yeah. in any case, look, Sharon, um, we could talk forever and ever. And I really appreciate the time you've given me this afternoon. And, oh, uh, I thank you for the opportunity. Um, stay safe and, and stay healthy. You too. Uh, you and too. Uh, let's stay in touch. So uh, Absolutely. Thank you very much. And to all my readers and of course the viewers, thanks for hanging in there and watching this. All the information for Sharon's website and her books and everything will be uh, linked throughout the uh, article here. Please give it a look-see. Uh, you won't find uh, better and more interesting, genuine uh, photography than you will share. And she freely shares her work and her uh, way of seeing, and uh, she's a good articulator, so I think you all enjoy it. And so with that, I want to say goodbye. We'll be back again with another conversation sometime very soon. And uh, thanks for visiting PXL. We're, we're enhancing your vision.